Well, good morning. Welcome to the Computer Security Seminar at Purdue University. Our speaker this morning is Brian Carrier. He'll be giving us a talk from his research area today titled, Defining a Digital Forensic Investigation. Brian? Thanks, Randy. So uh, my name is Brian. Again, um, I'm a PhD student here at Purdue. Um, in my area is digital forensics. And I kind of have the, uh, uh, I did my master's here a while back, took some time off, worked for a while in the consulting world and came back and was doing forensics while I was working as well. So it's kind of uh, an area that I'm working in in terms of uh, providing more theory into an area that has a uh, very practical to date so far. Um, and the basic goal here is basically to define what we mean by a forensic investigation, put some theory in this area. So basically outline is to give some background on the area, uh, discuss some of the process models that exist, um, define what we tried to solve with our problem and our, and our approach to doing this. So the basic background. So, so we ask, well, what's digital investigation or what is digital forensics? It's kind of one of these buzzwords that forensics is kind of thrown with every word these days just to kind of give uh, you know, some marketing, whatever. So we have to define you know, actually what this process is that we're defining as this investigation. And it's basically, the definition we're using, it's a process that develops and tests hypotheses to answer questions about digital events. It's kind of an academic definition here. And the basic problem here is that we have some event that you're some questions that to ask. So we have a, a server break-in or we have some employee is doing something they shouldn't be doing. And we have questions about this, such as, you know, who or what caused this event to occur? You know, when did it occur? When did the break-in happen? You know, why did it occur? Some very basic, you know, questions that we want to answer. So the process is we want to develop some kind of hypothesis about why it happened, or, you know, and try and find evidence to support these answers so we can, we can give answers to people who are asking them. So some, some common, you know, examples here. Are we have some kind of network server that's been broken into? You know, it could be a, you know, a web server or some other server that's been broken into by hackers or it's part of a corporate espionage type of thing or trying to get intellectual property out of the system. We may want to find out, you know, who broke in, what they had access to, how long have they been there, would they install, would they take, all these kind of basic, you know, questions. Uh, we could have, uh, you know, in a, in a corporate environment. Um, you know, most places have some kind of corporate usage policy of I will not use this computer for, you know, corporate gain of another company or, you know, viewing pornography in the office or, you know, various types of basic things that you can't use the company for. If HR finds you doing this, they may want to hire an investigator to find out whether you have been or not to look through email, your web caches or, you know, various things. Um, the third one's kind of unfortunately the most common investigation actually out there, which is looking at contraband images, which is generally child pornography. Uh, most law enforcement spend most of the time investigating this, the people downloading this and, you know, having these contraband images, which are illegal to have. So this is kind of a common investigation to occur, just a finding if they exist or not on a system. Um, and then another kind of investigation area is a, is a suspect in a physical crime that owns a computer. And this is actually another kind of increasingly common thing of we have someone who commits a murder or is suspected of committing a murder or, you know, kidnapping or various things, and they go to the computer and they have MapQuest directions to where they, you know, met someone or they, you know, have various drug terms on there or you know, Google searches on various things, and, you know, it's just kind of additional evidence of what they were doing in this actual crime. So this actually kind of happens more and more now with pretty every investigation. There's some component of the digital aspect now that we have, you know, computers in all parts of our lives. So what is the state of the art in the, in the area? Um, well, it's been driven by practical needs. And it's kind of started in the 80s with law enforcement of, of you know, whatever they need, something, a tool is developed. And actually, in the original days, basically, you'd take a hard drive out or you'd boot the computer. You'd find the computer, you'd turn it on, you'd poke around, you'd look at various files, open things up, and various things. They realized this was kind of bad because they're overwriting evidence in the process. So then they realized that, oh, well, we can take another computer, put the hard drive into it, mount it, view it. Again, we're modifying some things. And today, now we actually have specialized tools that we bring it into. It's read-only. We don't modify it. And it's a much better specialized tool that we have. Um, but but the, the main point here is it's been driven by practical needs and there's no underlying theory. If you look at other forensic areas like biology or, or DNA or fingerprints or um, you know, event reconstruction of trying to find the trajectory of a bullet from where it came from, these are all founded upon basic scientific principles of physics and biology and chemistry that existed way beforehand. I mean, we all did the trajectory examples and physics classes, and it's not really a, a science that was developed purely for this topic. We're just saying we're actually developing a lot of stuff practical-wise without underlying theory. Um, to date, most of the stuff is on the file system application data. So we're looking at you know, files or deleted files or recovering files, 
various application metadata. And it's basically five or six common you know, specialized tools that are out there that actually are, are helping us process. So process models. So, so as we get into like, we define what this is, one of the reasons we looked into was, okay, what are, the, what are the general process models that are used in this process to define this? And how can we use this to actually defining what the uh, investigation is in, in more grounding terms? So the United States Department of Justice has guidelines that they, that they have documented. And these came, I think, like the late 90s, 98, 99. These were published. And the goal of these guidelines were basically to give to police officers going to a, a crime scene, a house, or a building, or whatever, and if they find a computer, to give them general guidelines of what to do with it. You know, don't ignore it, because it may contain evidence. You know, so give them some basic you know, references to what to do. So they have five phases on here uh, of their guidelines. The first one is preparation. This is kind of you know, before the event or incident ever occurs, you know, to have your tools and equipment up to date, training, you know, basic you know, readiness types of things. First phase, when you get there, you know, kind of collection. You search the location for possible you know, things that may contain digital evidence. Um, and we collect them, we copy them, we make a copy of them or bring them back to our lab. We were exam the next thing is examine them, we review them for possible evidence in the, for looking for documents or images or files, whatever we're looking for. We have analysis, um, it's basically the reviewing the results for their value. I, I'm personally not a big fan of this, this term. If you actually look up the definitions of examination analysis, they actually cross-reference each other. So examination is a form of analysis, analysis is a form of examination. So, the analysis is more of like an interpretation. Uh, basically, we find our evidence and our results, and we interpret them in the bigger picture of what this means in the case. And the last thing is actually reporting, where we document the results of our investigation um, you know, for, for other people. So here's an example. So we have a scenario where we have a person suspected of, of creating forged documents, so check forgery or you know, identification forgery, or some, some kind of forged documents. And they're suspected of doing this on their computer. So we get our police, we have our search warrant, we raid the house with you know, shields out and everything else. But basically, here, here's the process that we go through in this, in this, in this scenario. So preparation, you know, we have our tools updated. Or we have people trained to use them and know what they're doing. They're certified. Um, then we go to the, the, the collection. So we go to the house, we find some computers, some printers, um, and several CDs lying around the house. So this is kind of the collection phase. We find these things. Well, the first thing we can either do is we can either you know, take them all back to our lab or we can just make copies of them. So this is kind of, we'll, we'll go through the copying process here. So here's a basic, this very simple process of how we go about copying this. So the first thing we'll do, who wish had basic cryptography classes? Is that one pretty much? Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is run the MD, this is all in Linux, basically. So run the MD5 sum command. MD5 is a cryptographic hash sum. Basically, you give it a bunch of data, and it spits out some unique, or not unique, but it spits out 128-bit value corresponding to that data. If you change one bit in there, it's gonna give it a different value. So the goal here, what we're doing is we're in a Linux system here. We have devhdd, which is a file that corresponds to the actual disk that we're analyzing. So this is the suspect's disk we have. And we're gonna take the MD5 value of their entire disk on the computer. So we read every bit from the disk and give us a hash value of the system. This is basically our, our, our signature or our checksum of the actual computer we're investigating. Our next step here, we use the dd command, which is a, another Unix-based command that basically moves data from one location to another. It's kind of a systematic way. And so here in this command now, we're actually reading this, this, this suspect hard, hard disk, and we're basically writing it to some other file called mount case disk onedd So basically we're copying every sector from the disk and putting it in some other file on, on our computer. And then we, we again run the MD5 command on this file to get its, its hash value. And the reason we do this is basically to verify this process was accurate. If any time in this process, we didn't copy a byte or a bit or whatever, there was some error in the process, these two values will be different, and we know we haven't made an accurate image, and this becomes important because we're gonna have to testify in court that we actually analyzed you know, the accurate data. So if we don't have this process, we're not quite sure if we have the accurate representation of the actual computer. So this is our collection phase in this process. Um, then we actually go through examining. So in this case, our scenario is we have you know, some kind of forged documents. So our hypothesis is basically that the person is using their computer to create various forged documents. So how do we test this? It's kind of the whole scientific method here. It's our hypothesis. How do we test this? We look for evidence that kind of supports this, this hypothesis. So we may find files that are documents or graphic images. We may have you know, JPEGs or, or Photoshop files that look like the documents themselves. We could have Word or some other you know, word processing document um, 
files that contain the, the forged documents, programs that actually you know, make these files, evidence of printing. You know, we found that printer there. We want to know whether they actually printed these documents and actually were the, were the source of making them. So we want to find there's a history of printing from the system. So once we, we'll search for all these things using various techniques, and we'll actually, then we we'll actually go through and analyze them to, to find the bigger context to interpret them in their situation. So one example could be to you know, compare the documents with what we found. We have some we know they were forged with. You know, are these the same documents that we, we have evidence that they existed? And then the reporting, which is the, the documentation, the usual reporting of what we found in, this, in, the, in the case. So this is a, as an example, this is, this is actually one of my tools. But um, I tried to find other tools, but I couldn't find the screenshots on the website, actually. So this is basically a, a, an example of what we have here. In this examination phase, in this, in, this, in this collection phase back here, the result of this was if we had a 20 gig hard drive here that we, that we were imaging, this file is going to be 20 gigs. So this, this file is going to be the same exact size as the actual hard disk was. And what we do in this phase is we actually import this huge file, this 20 or 60 or 100 gig file, into some analysis software that will actually allow us to view the files and, and the actual data on there. So this is an example of one of the tools. This is, again, mine. It's, it's called Autopsy. And you basically import the, uh, the file in there, and it gives you the usual file manager look of listing the files, showing you the strings or the output down here, and you can get the hashes, you can do keyword searches, timeline searches, all these other various you know, techniques for searching evidence. So, so that, that's the nice DOJ model that we have. So here's, we'll get, go through a couple more that are, you know, there's dozens of these models actually. But I'm going to give three that are kind of in separate areas in the, in the um, the spectrum is to kind of give a reference of what we're looking at and trying to compare to. So here's an incident response model. And this comes from uh, Mandia and Persisi. This is out of their incident response book. They were former Foundstone uh, consulting members. Um, so here, here's the phases they have. And you can see there's many more in their, in their process than the DOJ one. So the first one we have is preparation. Again, we prepare for the incident, get ready for it. Then we have detection. Again, our focus here is more of incident response in a corporate environment servers being broken into or other critical infrastructure being broken into. So you have some kind of detection phase, whether it's IDS or some user reporting error, or some, some, some reporting of an actual incident. We want to verify it in our initial response. You know, there's a lot of false alerts on IDS systems, so we actually want to verify it's a, a, a real alert and not just some false alarm in the process. Once we get this, we have a strategy formulation where we say, okay, we think it's um, this system is fairly critical. We can't take it down. Let's use this approach, or it's not critical. We'll go through this method. Duplicate system. Again, it's the same process as we saw before, it's using DD to copy it. This is a specific you know, item in this model. Investigation, we search for evidence or other various you know, techniques to find our evidence of, of, the, system, of uh, the, the incident. Secure measure implementation, which is basically you know, taking other measures to make sure that we can secure the system or other systems like it. Network monitoring. Um, recovery, reporting, again, all, all basic things of trying to make sure this doesn't happen again so we can recover the system or so we can monitor things to prevent further damage. So here's a basic example. This one we have, you know, Linux servers being uh, suspected of being compromised by, uh, by an outside person. We deploy our response team. And here are our basic phases here. Initial response is basically to, um, you know, we verify it by looking at, you know, logs for certain rootkit signatures. So when a lot of times people break into servers, they install rootkits. Um, and there's many signatures of rootkits that we can easily detect. Um, you know, for example, there's um, some examples. So I show here's where rootkits are actually. Everyone, no? Okay, so rootkits are used basically to hide data. So we actually go through and we we they're deployed or installed on the system to actually hide data from the investigator. So it looks like a normal system when there's really bad things going on. So a common example is, you know, to take the ls command in, in Unix, which basically lists the files in a given directory. So if the attacker installed files in the directory, they do ls, these are going to jump out as being, you know, files from the attacker. So what they do is they modify the ls so it hides those files. There's basically a configuration file somewhere that says, if you see one of these files, don't show it to the user. Um, and it's going to occur at basic levels in the system, whether we modify the ls command, whether we modify the kernel, whether we modify libraries. There, there's several places we can do this, but the basic goal here is to, is to have some kind of modify, modify the system somehow so that the actual evidence isn't shown to the investigators. And we can do this for the ls command, the ps command to show processes, you know, netstat to show open ports, et cetera. 
But there's some kind of signatures we can see in this process. So for example, in the, the, the dev directory on Unix, where we see all our, our device files, there's thousands of files in there in Linux, thousands of them. So, and they're all archaic names, like we saw before, HDD or PTYP0, all these you know, very basic short names of various random letters. So a common hiding technique is to, to throw a file in there with some other archaic name, but put your configuration files in there, to put other things in there, which is a list of the files that should be hidden or processes that should be hidden. So we can find that actually by looking for signatures in that directory to see whether or not these have been installed in the system. Uh, we can do port scans to see if there's open, you know, Trojan uh, programs that have been running to allow the attacker access to the computer. Um, we can look at the logs to find out if they're missing log entries or if they're logs of the attack. Ba basic, you know, formal things we can go through to verify with basic techniques that we actually have an incident. Then we formulate our strategy. In this case, it's not a critical system. It's a, it's a basic, you know, secondary DNS server or, or you know, backup web server. It's not critical, so we'll take it offline. Otherwise, we have to do some kind of online live analysis. So we use our DD to copy the system of the hard disks. Um, and then we import our disk in our analysis tool like we did before. And we look for various now things about the, our, our system now. Now our hypothesis is that we've been attacked by you know, an outside person. And we're looking for various evidence of this, this attack. So Trojan executables, you know, hidden data. We can use timeline analysis to find out what happened in the system. You know, they broke in this time. We have activity over here at this time. I'm trying to map all these various pieces together. After we find out how they get in, we may want to patch the similar systems on, on the network so that other, others aren't broken into in the same way. We deploy network monitoring to record traffic. You know, then we rebuild a system from scratch so that we don't risk having any Trojan or execute, uh, bad you know, executables on the system. So as, as a last one we'll get to, this is one actually we, we again, the point is these are all very in different areas of our approaches. The one that we proposed a couple years ago was on basically the crime scene. If you look at a physical crime scene, you know, books for, for cops and law enforcement that go into an area, there's basically a set procedures that go when you get to this house to, to investigate the, the place. So we, we applied that to the digital world to see if they, how well it mapped through. And there's five basic phases in, in this process. One is to preserve the crime scene. So you get there, you, know, you deploy the yellow tape around the house, you detain your suspects or your witnesses to find out, you know, to make sure we have everyone who stays there prevent people from walking through the house and just kind of preserve the general scene. Then we do a survey where we take a brief walk through the house or the building to find the obvious evidence to kind of get a scope or a feeling of what actually happened. We document with video and, and, and photographs and sketches and various things. And then we do a full search of the house or building for all the evidence. And then the final phase is reconstruction where we, you know, we find a bullet hole in the wall or we find some blood splatter and they actually do a reconstruction to find out, well, based on the angle of this, and you know, we know what kind of gun it is. It probably came from this location or that location. Try and reconstruct what happened in the building. So the question is, can we apply this to the actual digital world? And this is what we actually do with this. And it's basically the same kind of thing. So we preserve it where we you know, isolate the computer. We make a copy of it. We preserve the state of it. We survey it for obvious evidence, similar to the verification phase we saw with the incident response model. We document it. Can we search and we reconstruct the events to determine how it got there? So we, we see these, these three models, and, and there's you know, many others. But the, 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 so what's the problem? I mean, these are great, these are great instruction training tools that we saw. They're, they're insightful when you're learning how to do investigation about what the process is to use them. But the problem is that you know, we're looking at trying to define technical requirements, that we wanted to define how do we test tools? How do we create tools? How do we define requirements for various tools? And you know, th th these are very kind of vague. For example. In the incident response model, how is the verification phase different from investigation? In the verification, we were looking for basic evidence of the, of the of incident occurred before we started the full investigation. Well, how's it different from investigation? I mean, we're, in both cases, we're searching for evidence, and we're trying to find proper ways of finding it and, re and, and recovering it. So you know, it, it, it seems, though, in, in scope, the verification is a smaller scale or smaller scope subset of the investigation phase. In the crime scene model that we had, you know, how is survey different from searching? Again, same principles here that we're searching for different things, different scale, different scope, different purposes, but it's the same basic concepts here. And, and the, the end problem is that the process models are, are, are relatively arbitrary. Um, it's not mentioned here, but the, the Digital Forensics Research Workshop actually had a focus last year on frameworks and process models. 
And um, there were four of us that presented various forms of these. And it was amazing to find out how many different phases people would have. Some had 17, some had five, some had two, some had three. You know, I mean, these are all fairly arbitrary. You know, you kind of, I approach it with a 10 phase. Some could be four phases. It all depends on the granularity you want to define for each phase. So, you know, for example, in the incident response model we have, does the investigation phase, is it the same thing as both the analysis and examination phase of the Department of Justice model? Are they different? Are they the same? You know, or the, is the data analysis different from the crime scene event reconstruction? These are all kind of arbitrary containers we've assigned to these things without having any kind of underlying theory about what the minimum requirements are. So, you may be asking, well, is this just kind of an academic exercise of trying to define general theory for you know, the sake of doing academic work? And it's actually really not. Because you look at the Daubert guidelines for entering technical evidence into a US court, there's, there's a few guidelines you have to meet. One is, has the procedure been published and generally accepted in, in, in journals, especially, not necessarily conferences, but journals, has been published and accepted by the community that was used to get this evidence. And the second major category is, has it been tested by you know, various experts, and what is the error rate, and is there a known error rate for this process? And these guidelines basically haven't been met at all, or haven't been strongly met for digital evidence. And there hasn't been many challenges in the courts to the evidence to actually force these guidelines to be met. So the current state you know, for publishing procedures, um, they basically have none of them have been published. They're all basically closed tools, and it's an intellectual property concern where they don't want to, to say how they're doing stuff because it you know, could potentially ruin their market share. Um, the closest thing are open source tools, but even they don't publish them in a documented format. You can read the source code to find out what they're doing, but there's still no detailed procedure of what they're actually doing. So the, the, so far, there's, very no, there's no procedure at all, basically, that's been published on this actual process. Um, for testing and error rates, there's been basic testing and that's occurred by NIST, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology. And actually, Jim Lyle was here last year talking about this. And they basically you know, have done disk acquisition tools, which is basically you know, imaging the, the system before of you know, copying the, the system to, 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 to files. They've done software write blockers, which are these tools you install in your systems that you don't write to a disk when you're examining it. So th these, are but these are all very basic techniques. Um, and there's been no formal testing of file systems at all. The closest thing are, are some images I have up on a, a SourceForge site, a digital forensics tools testing. And they're basically very small file system images that will test a, a certain thing like keyword searching or um, you know, file recovery, et cetera. But they're, they're fairly informal. They're not nearly as formal and rigorous as what NIST normally does for testing. So in general, there's still no even error rates a, from a formal analysis procedure for the area. So this is kind of what the motivation for this work was to define requirements and procedures so that we can actually start moving ahead with these and start defining these guidelines. So the proposed solution is basically to define technical areas that, that are involved in this process you know, based on how evidence is created. Um, and the issue is this may not resemble an actual process model. This could just be um, you know, general areas, um, but you know, we can actually then map them into the actual process model. And then we have to define requirements based on each area so we can actually start working on the guidelines. So definitions here before we get this. So, Basic definitions here. So an object in this case is basically some kind of collection of digital data. This could be a byte, could be a sector, could be a file, could be a chunk of process memory, could be any, any basically finite you know, bounded collection of data. We have a state, which is the value of an object's characteristics. So one way to think about this is like a data structure, all its different values, those are its characteristics. Or we're going to say it's the value in general. So the, 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 the state of a file could be its content you know, value. Um, you know, memory example, any, any kind of object, it's, its value is basically its state. So we have some kind of event with basically an occurrence that changes the state of one or more objects. We have some event that occurs, and we have an object that has a new value in it now. So a cause is basically an object whose state was used in the event. So an executable or a process is used to actually cause an event to occur. And we have an effect who are the objects that were, that were changed by this actual event. So here's our, our basic schematic, you know, visual process here. And this is a very, this is a very high level right now. Um, but our cause, we have this notepad process that's running in memory. It's going away. We have our operating system that's also running in memory. This is a buffer in the notepad process. And we want to save our, our buffer, our, what we're typing into a file. So this basic, very high level event, basically the, the effect of this event 
is that we have the notepad process, which is in a new state. It's changed notes, instruction pointer, various other things to some other state in its code. So it's in, it's in a new state. We have this new file one.txt file that's been created on the disk to represent you know, this, this new file. So it didn't exist before, and it's a new uh, object in the system. And we have our operating system that's now, you know, there's a file descriptor or some other data structure in, in the operating system that's now changed state because of this, this event. So when we look, now we have to look at what evidence is. And basically an incident or a crime is basically that an event that violates a policy or a law on the system. And basically, you know, so we have this event back here. Let's say this is actually, you know, some illegal file. This may be the, the illegal event that was created when we save this file to our, our desktop or our, our system. That this is our, our event that we're investigating. So basically, we're, we're trying to investigate these types of events. And the, the concept here is that there's only evidence of the event if the effect still exists. If you go back here, if this file object, or, you know, these two are memory. Network process and the operating system are memory. So when the computer turns off, these are gone. So when we go investigate the system later on, you know, we may find this file1.txt file on the actual hard disk. But if it doesn't, it's not there, then we have no evidence that this event ever existed. And this is, we don't know if it, we can, we can hypothesize that it occurred. We actually have no evidence that it actually occurred at all in the system. So the point is we have to find these effect objects to actually say whether the event occurred or not. So basically our digital evidence is basically some object that contains reliable information that supports or refutes some hypothesis. So if our hypothesis was, you know, that this, you know, notepad process was used to save this file, we have to find this information as actual evidence that this actual event actually occurred. And if we can't find it, we have to be able to explain why we, why we didn't find it um, and what, what certainty we think it, didn't, it occurred. So it's basically broken up into three different phases now then of with this in mind, this notion of the events in mind. And the basic goal now of our investigation is to determine the events that occurred by recognizing um, your digital evidence in the system. So there's three actually types. And this actually is very similar to our crime scene investigation um, approach, but with, with a few missing phases. Um, so the first phase is preservation. Second one is actually evidence searching. And the third one is uh, reconstruction. So the preservation. The goal of this process is basically to preserve the state of as many objects as possible and document the crime scene. Again, the point here is, if we don't have that effect object, then we don't know what occurred. So if that effect object is ever changed by other processing, we've, we could have lost the evidence of the incident, of the event. So we want to preserve that state as much as possible in the system. So the common methods for doing this are basically shut the system down and make a copy of it. We saw that in the examples we did in the scenarios. Another example, if we can't take it down because it's too critical for some reason, we can unplug it from the network so the attackers still can't access the system and cause more damage. Um, if we can't unplug it, maybe it's a really very critical web server you know, at uh, Google or some other critical place that can't turn it down. We can look for suspicious processes and you know, just kill them off or suspend them or isolate the ones that we think are, are suspicious in the area. Or we can do nothing, which isn't very effective, but you know, it's still a legit response to actually just let things go and you know, just investigate it live while it's still running. So when looking at this, though, from the technical necessity of the process, is this a technical necessity? I mean, this is, every process model you will look at will include you know, this phase in it. The question is, do we really need this phase in terms of a technical requirement? And actually, I, I say no, that investigation does not necessarily need this preservation. And I gave this presentation at a, at a, a workshop once, or a, one based on this. Um, and I almost got burned at the stake for this, for this comment, um, because many people are, are trained to always copy the system, copy the system. Um, and, and the point is that we don't really need it for a technical requirement. And the example I uh, kind of use is if we're you know, in an office environment, and we go to the break room, and you know, someone is taking the last pot of coffee without starting a new pot. You know, there could be five of us that, that go out to try and hunt down this person to find out who it was to took the last pot of coffee. And I'm sure there'll be five ways of doing this. Every person does this will go through different ways of trying to find that person. Someone may go through the thermometer, you know, to measure everyone's coffee. Some people may just ask around. Some may get surveillance tapes. You know, some people may lock down the entire building so no one can get out. But the point is that we don't necessarily need to actually lock down the building to find it. I mean, all five people could find 
the same person without going through the same process or locking down everything. So in this case, we don't necessarily need to preserve it, but we risk losing evidence in the process. We, 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 risk, we risk the person leaving the building and never finding them in the process, but we could also find it without it. So it's not necessarily a necessity. Um, but it is a necessity when we get in a forensic investigation. The difference here is that we involve forensics now, we're involving law. If you look at the definition of forensics, it's basically using, applying science technology for purposes of law, or there's some variation of the definition. So in this case, if we're actually using this in a court of law, and we actually want to have this be legal evidence, then we may need to start having our preservation process so we can verify it's the original scene. So in that case, we may need to have our, our preservation process here for a, for a forensics um, process. You know, in that example, our, our bitwise images needed. You know, the DD copy was every single bit from the system was copied over to our file. You know, is this really needed for a full investigation? If you look at, you know, the physical world, when, a, you know, a, a crime happens in a building, do we take that entire building, bring it to a lab, and keep it there forever? And that's basically what we're doing now with these computers. We have it there forever in case we need to look at it again in the future or so the defense can look at it and various things. You know, there isn't as much of an analogy in the physical world with, with taking or, or isolating a house forever of, of always make, keeping it isolated for, you know, for the rest of its existence. So this is kind of a thing that, you know, it, this, this, this process is needed because of the current tools required it's basically to happen, and it should always occur. But the question is whether this is kind of needed you know, as a long-term thing. And the, the issue here is legal requirements basically dictate the requirements of this phase. So if you wanted to find requirements for this for testing or development purposes, it's basically dictated by what legal requirements and business requirements are more than pure technology itself. Um, and in general, I mean, this acquisition and making copies should, is, is very preferred. Don't get me wrong. Um, it should always occur when it's possible, but you know, there's more and more people now who are looking at this. Um, you know, when you look at these you know, terabyte servers or you know, multi you know, systems, it's impractical to make a copy of that entire system and analyze it you know, through. So a lot of corporate environments are looking at this now and reconsidering you know, different approaches to actually doing a minimal acquisition or preservation. So second major area is the actual searching. And the basic point of this is we need our evidence. We need to find that, that effect object or the cause object to actually say that this event occurred or not. So the basic goal here is to recognize the objects you know, that may contain information about our incident. So our basic approach here, develop a hypothesis, define you know, what we think the evidence is going to have, and then try and find it. Um, so again, basically the, the whole searching here hypothesis. So an example before we had with our forged documents, um, you know, our hypothesis was that this person was using this computer to develop you know, images or documents that were of forged documents. That's our hypothesis. So we're looking for you know, files that, that, match these, these, that match this hypothesis, which could be image or word documents or other documents. So we have to define the characteristics of this evidence. So if we're thinking about you know, uh, a JPEG image, for example, or a Word document, there are certain characteristics of the file that we can look at. So for, well, JPEG's the simplest. We'll go for that one. You know, most of the JPEG files end with .jpg, or JPEG as the extension of the file. So a very basic search would be to search the entire computer for all files that meet that extension. Well, it's very simple, actually, for someone to change that extension to avoid you know, the search being successful. So you can look at the actual structure of the file. You look at the structure of the file, you know, the first two bytes of every JPEG file are FFD8, I think is, or D9 in hex. Um, you know, they're, they're the same two bytes in all JPEG files that match that occurrence. So instead, we can modify our search now to look for all files that begin with, you know, the hex values FFD8 and end with FFD9. And you know, the other characteristics in the, in, the, in the middle of the file, such as the, the actual image as a, as a certain, you know, uh, you know, mathematical relationship to other stuff around us. We can search for characteristics of these files to help us find a specific image type. And we basically go through and compare this with all of our, our objects in the system. So as an example here, you know, we define our, our, our target. We, have, we extract all of our data and interpret it out of the system. We compare the two together. And the ones we identify are, are our actual evidence of the, of the system. So what are our requirements in this process here? Well, the first is we must accurately define our, our target, what we're looking for. So if the computer is allowing us to search this automatically, you'd be able to accurately you know, define this target based on this. Um, the bigger issue is we need to accurately interpret and you know, extract the data out. And this is actually the most, basically what all tools currently do. 
is they basically take this file system image in and they process it using this proprietary, you know, various formats. So what's required for this? Well, there's basically this process where, you know, we have to process the file system or Word documents or PDF files or various other proprietary formats. We need to be able to process them. We need to reverse engineer them in this process. Um, and it basically could be multiple interpretations of that data in general. Um, there's an image I have on the testing site where it's basically, there's an NTFS file system and the UFS file system or from the Unix world on, in the same partition. And they both happily coexist and they're there and they, they have you know, their own locations. If you, if you import that into most tools, at least before the image is released, then it almost shows NTFS file. as an NTFS file system and ignore the UFS part of it. So this is kind of the, the process here. It's not accurately interpreting it because there are actually multiple interpretations of that one file system that can actually hide data in, the, in, in this investigation process. Um, and then the actual comparison process between the, the target and the, uh, the extracted data. So what's the existing research in this area? Um, there's actually interesting work um, by Stollard and Levitt out of Davis, um, which basically looks at automated analysis for digital forensic science. And this was um, his master's thesis. And basically, the, the approach here is that we read some log files in of a Unix system. So we look at the, uh, the wtemp file, which basically shows when people logged in from this time to this time. And it goes through this log file, looking at the various log in, log out times in the system, and then examines the, uh, the MAC times on the files. So every file has a modified access or change time associated with that. And this tool goes through, looks at the, uh, when people should be logged in, and compares the actual MAC times on files that are owned by these users to find out whether or not it's reasonable that they were logged in or not. So we may find you know, that if my account was used to, to be broken in to the system, um, you know, they, my account was used to break in, they cleared the wtemp file to hide the existence that it was there, but I may have some files under my name that were created during that time frame. So this basically goes through and defines this. So we're, we're using the wtemp file to define our targets, you know, basically based on this data. So we're looking at, you know, files owned by user carrier and, you know, created in this time range. Um, most of the work in this area is, is manual. Basically, you know, it's a manual. I'm looking for, you know, Etsy password files. So I go to Etsy and I go to password. Or I'm looking for, you know, the Internet Explorer history file or, or cache directory. It's, it, it's all basically a manual process of finding the target and visually comparing them, not really defining it in the tool itself. Pretty much every you know, malware, virus, antivirus checking tool um, is basically this process of there's a, there's a standard target of we know virus has this signature, basically this all, or IDS areas are all this, this area. The extraction process is basically what all current forensics tools do. You give the disk image, you give a, a partition image, and extracts out the various data in the various formats. Um, I did a paper on this a few years ago on this process. This is kind of what the main focus of all the current tools are. And the comparison process is pretty much visual now, as I said before. You look at a directory, you find this directory name, you open it up, look for this file name. And the last kind of phase or area in this basic process is the event reconstruction. So we, ha we have our objects now as the evidence, we have our, our, our potential cause and effects, and we now want to answer you know, events that occurred in the system. And the main motivation for this is actually, or one of the motivations now for this, is the actual Trojan defense. I'm not sure if people have heard this or not, but in the past couple years or so, um, there's been more and more cases where computer, um, people who are suspected of computer crimes or computer-related crimes are using the defense that, I didn't do this. You know, there was a Trojan virus backdoor in my computer that some hacker put there, and you know, they put the evidence there, and it wasn't necessarily me. And there are several cases of this, actually. Um, there's a, uh, I did a paper with a law professor last year. It's on a serious bib tech. If you want to look at it, there's many cases in there of this. But there's one of the most famous one was one in the UK where there's a person who uh, was suspected of doing a denial of service attack on the port of Houston. And they basically took, took down the ports, down, com ports computers down. They tracked it back to this guy. This guy's a self-admitted hacker, but he basically said it wasn't me. It was some of my you know, rival ha you know, hacker friends who basically set my computer up. And they used a backdoor program that securely wiped itself, which is why the police didn't find any evidence of it. So the, the scenario here is that this is a you know, person. There's no evidence of any malware or Trojan programs on his computer. But you know, the jury was convinced that um, this could have existed and wiped itself clean from the system, which is why it wasn't found. Now, it's a legit scenario. It's a completely legit scenario. 
that it could actually have occurred and all evidence is overwritten. But um, you know, the, question, the, the point is that merely finding the files isn't necessarily enough now to kind of get evidence. There's more demand for trying to find um, you know, how it actually got there. Um, there's another interesting case actually that in the US that there was a, 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 an accountant who was basically uh, brought up on charges of tax fraud, where he was, you know, was forging his documents, his tax filings to pay less taxes. And his claim was that there was a virus that came in and modified his you know, TurboTax or whatever program he was using that modified his tax documents to actually you know, change the prices. And that's why he paid less, because you know, the program told him to. The ironic thing is that he's an accountant, and he had many other files on his computer from his clients. You know, but their files weren't changed in the process. It was only his file that was changed by this virus in the process. But I mean, this, he got off as well in terms of uh, an acquittal of this process. So it's kind of there's, there could be legit defenses, but it's kind of more of a, an ongoing problem now to actually start defining how data got there and how evidence got there versus just merely saying, well, this file exists on the computer, therefore this person's guilty. So the goal here is to determine you know, basically how they got there. Um, and this isn't what's supported any tools right now. So this is kind of the new areas of a lot of research to actually find out, trying to learn more about the system. And basic approach is to analyze the evidence, or approach that we're having with this is analyze the evidence, determine what role it could have played as a cause or effect, uh, basically construct the events from the cause and effects, and basically sequence them into some kind of chains. So, you know, graphical wise here, and it's very high level. We have, we have our objects we found, you know, X, Y, Z, W from our, from our searching. We analyze them, we say that, well, you know, X could have been a cause of some event. Um, that changed its state to X prime, you know, Y could be the cause of the event. We're not quite sure what C and B are, but you know, we know they're involved somehow. And we developed these hypotheses about what could have occurred with these. So you know, Y could be executable. And we go through and we re reverse engineer it to find out major events it could have caused. Or it could be a configuration file that was used. So we develop all these, these, these general role classifications or hypotheses for the system. Then we basically put them together. So we analyze them, we find out we have. We may want to search for, we know that you know, this object B here has certain characteristics, so we search the system to find it if we don't already have it. You know, we try and put them together. You know, if we can find evidence that they actually occur together, it could be multiple scenarios, has some kind of confidence level with them, and try and sequence them. This is again, like kind of euphoric, you know, nice utopian um, you know, process to this that is very difficult in practice. Um, again, researching here, uh, actually some people here, Mark Rogers and Megan Carney, did some uh, work before, and the Trojan made me do it. It's basically a, a statistical way of looking at, you know, uh, was this file downloaded or, you know, from Internet Explorer, or came here from this program, or came here from this program. More statistics way of looking at, you know, is there support to, to define this. Um, another approach to doing this has been a finite state machine, which is kind of difficult for a large scale, but using a subset of a program to make a finite state machine for it. So we find it in this state, therefore what Phases must have occurred in the past to get us to the state. Um, Peter Stephenson was here last year, I think it was. Um, he did it, uh, an area on using uh, petri nets, um, more, more along the lines of hypothesis testing. Uh, if we think this, this process occurred, do we have evidence to support whether or not it actually occurred? Um, so good time. The, the actual conclusion here is that we have this, all these process models that describe you know, how you can do an investigation and are great for training and, and um, you know, for general guidelines. Um, but they're very useful for defining actual technology requirements. Um, and this approach and this work is basically to define you know, three basic areas on, you know, related to how events work. Um, as a side note, we've actually moved away from this work or gone much, much lower in detail um, in that we, the high level approach that we have here of these high level events make a lot of assumptions and we can't really give certainty values based on this high level. So we're actually going much lower actually looking at you know, instruction level events and you know, much lower level details to actually force us to show you know, and model where we're making assumptions about the high level events versus actual computer operation. So that's it. Question. You said there's a lot of the stuff with Trojans going on, like saying someone else, you know, Trojan made me do it. But what about uh, someone, like when you set up a home network, a wireless network, it's typically left open. You know, by default. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple cases, I think, where someone has said that, you know, I didn't know my network was open. Someone logged in, went and viewed the kitty porn, and it looked like it came from my, you know, my network, but it wasn't me. And is there any way to, can, are there any tools to look for that type of, you know, like someone 
Do you check like the logs or something to, to determine if someone's done that, or is that not? Is that a little bit? Yeah, it, it's, it's actually, I mean, there's, a, there's actually a, a, a similar case that kind of came out that it was a few weeks ago that was actually formed where they, this, I think in the D.C. area or somewhere that, you know, this person was driving around, you know, trying to find wireless access points and, you know, doing all this, his activity from these access points and, you know, just moving on to somewhere else. So they actually, you know, they eventually, tra I don't know how they actually tracked him down in the end, uh, but they actually managed to, to figure out it was him somehow. Um, so it was just all manual, like yeah, because I mean, most, most access points don't have any kind of logging, yeah. you know. And you know, there's actually even um, in, in the paper we did, we actually referenced there was a there's actually an article like in you know one of security online security you know articles whatever, and it basically mentioned you know that hey this is a good you know defense if you're doing it just kind of keep your access point open, and you know claim ignorance and you know, say it wasn't me even if it was you you know, kind of thing. And also, um, we were saying this you could like. Do certain things to preserve a machine without taking it down, like unplugging it from the network. Are there any? Has there been any history of rootkits being aware of that, saying, "All right, you know, maybe they're trying to shut. You know, they're kind of trying to start an investigation, start wiping data now." You know. Well, there, there. Well, there's two things. I mean, one, one is that there's. It's not uncommon to have like. Well, it wasn't before. Now, I haven't seen it in a while, but there's. You know, the shutdown command could be Trojan. That when you type the shutdown, it actually wipes out the entire system. And we actually had a case for that once when I was working that, you know, that that was the case. And we, had, you know, it was unplugged, so it was didn't impact it, you know, so we didn't use it. But you know, if we had issued the shutdown command, it would have, you know, wiped out part of the system in the process. Um, I mean, there there aren't necessarily any Trojans that I've heard of that, you know, will look for you imaging the system, and 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 do that process. But that's a much harder process of trying to, you know. Determine if you're reading every sector on the disk sequentially after this amount of time, you know, that there's a problem. Yeah. You mentioned that a lot of the other uh, crime scene you know, investigations are based on existing science, like the bullet trajectory based on physics and fingerprints on statistics or whatever. What are, what are some of the sciences that we need to define or uh, develop for digital forensics. What are some examples of, that have been uh, filled in? We got to fill in the blanks afterwards. So where are you going with that? What are some things that have well, been? Well, a lot of what we're finding out is it's basically all areas. I mean, it's not a say new science. It's more of just working the theory into the process. So it's, you know, that that we're realizing this process. There's a lot of stuff with programming languages and actual program structure. There's a lot of work actually in operating systems. And networking it, it's actually mo pretty much all areas of computer science have theory that applies to it. It just hasn't hasn't, hasn't been applied yet to actually, you know, apply that and then you know, use that theory to to actually better define you know, requirements and the needs. There are there. some things that you need to do formally in that definition to make it stand up in a court of law, for example. That that kind of remains. I don't know. That that's more of the case law. exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, to date, you know. With what's been used so far, um, you know, the, one of the examples of, that's been used for the, the Daubert guidelines of, you know, publishing procedures, the example given in one of the things is that you know that there's, um, you know, a computer magazine, actually computer magazine did like a, a an overview, a product review of of how a tool worked, and that was considered enough of a published procedure, you know, for for that, and that was accepted. Um, you know, th th that's not nearly the same level of detail as, you know, other sciences, but I guess it kind of depends, depends on the judge and I guess the uh, how, how strong the lawyers are in pushing it, I guess, in terms of what is accepted, I guess. What type of support has uh, OS vendors been giving to uh, forensic uh, uh, detectives, like as, as in specific application data or operating system data that you wouldn't normally know about? I mean, specifically, Microsoft being a closed source operating system, that they would be able to do a lot of things that you wouldn't know about. So, uh, what type of support do they lend to that? Yeah, so the question is that, you know, what support is, have vendors and, you know, operating systems people given? It's actually been very little. Well, actually, Microsoft actually announced last week, I think, or two weeks ago, that they're going to start releasing tools, internal only, tools that were internal only to law enforcement to help them with investigations. And they haven't announced what tools they are. Or what they'll do, but they're actually announcing that they're going to have a, a more proactive approach with law enforcement, not necessarily commercial, you know, people, but law enforcement in, in this process. Um, but a lot of it's been, you know, just kind of 
reverse engineering, mainly reverse engineering stuff. And uh, uh, the bigger issues like with, with cell phones and other things that are you know always changing and very you know different among you know they're all different. They all very specific formats. Um, and I, I know a lot of cell phone companies will help people out with you know getting data off of those systems, but. Um, I think for the for the a lot of other stuff, it's it's more of a reverse engineering process. Thank you.